Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, I want to discuss two of the factors that lead to stabilization of the glenohumeral joint. That is, really keeping that humeral head tightly bound in the glenoid fossa and preventing dislocation. Now, in total, there are four mechanisms that lead to this. Three of them are non-ligamentous mechanisms, meaning they do not involve ligaments directly, okay, or at all. And then one of them is the ligaments, basically, or you can think of it as the ligament mechanism. It literally is the ligaments. And so the three non-ligamentous mechanisms are actually a lot more important and produce a lot more stabilization of the shoulder joint than the ligaments do. So that's kind of counterintuitive. And here, we're going to be discussing two of those non-ligamentous mechanisms. Those are muscle balance and concavity compression. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. But before we do that, I think it's important to review a little bit at least of some of the relevant anatomy here. Okay, so let's start up here with the clavicle. I think we can all recognize the clavicle at this point. Clavicle has two ends. Over here would be the sternal end, that's medial, or we could say proximal, and then lateral or distal over here would be the acromial end. Now the sternal end over here articulates with the manubrium of the sternum. That would be the sternoclavicular joint, not labeled here. Over here, the acromial end of the clavicle is going to articulate with the acromial process or acromion of the scapula. And so this joint between the clavicle and the acromion is the AC joint or acromioclavicular joint. Um, this large bone right here, of course, is the scapula. We're looking at an anterior view, and we can actually tell that by a couple of reasons. One, this structure right here, the coracoid process, when we compare that to the acromion, the acromion is more posterior, and the coracoid process is more anterior. And so because it looks like the coracoid is a little closer to the viewer, that means we're looking at an anterior view. Also, another dead giveaway is that if we were looking at the posterior view, the spine of the scapula, which kind of goes across right here, it's kind of a large protrusion horizontally, that spine would be visible. We can't see a spine, so this must be the anterior view. Over here is the humerus. Okay, here's the shaft of the humerus going down. Um, we have this groove right here. The nice three-dimensional looking picture gives you some perspective. This is the bicipital groove, um, sometimes called the intertubercular groove, uh, because it technically lies between two tubercles. This tubercle right here is the lesser tubercle, and then this one over here is the greater tubercle. Greater tubercle is more lateral, and it actually exists a little bit more posteriorly as well. So greater tubercle, lesser tubercle, intertubercular groove, or bicipital groove. And being a groove, it's going to have an elevation or a lip on either side. Over here would be the medial lip of the bicipital groove. Over here is the lateral lip of the bicipital groove. And over here in green, this large convexity of the humerus is just the humeral head. And this concavity on the scapula, here's the neck of the scapula, and it moves into this, which is the glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity. These two structures in green, the humeral head of the humerus and the glenoid fossa of the scapula, these two bones articulate to make up the glenohumeral joint. Now, one important thing here is that that humeral head you can tell is a lot larger um, compared to the small glenoid fossa. And this isn't just an exaggerated picture. This is actually a fairly accurate picture of what it looks like. So the question is, how can I have this really large humeral head here that fits in this really tiny socket, so to speak, the glenoid fossa, and have this joint have any stability? Because by this logic, because the head is so much larger than the socket, this bone, the humerus, really ought to just dislocate very easily, but it doesn't do so easily. All this stability of the glenohumeral joint is provided by these mechanisms. So remember, we have three non-ligamentous mechanisms. These are two of them, and then we have ligaments. Okay, that's the fourth one. These are two of the three non-ligamentous mechanisms, and to really understand muscle balance and concavity compression, we need to take a look at some of the muscles and see how they insert and how they pull on the humerus. Okay. Now, this, of course, is 
the humerus. This is the head of the humerus right here. The glenoid fossa has been eliminated just for the sake of clarity, but understand that the glenoid fossa and the scapula would just be over here to the right on the picture of the humerus. All right. So first we have the deltoid muscle. So the deltoid muscle we know sits on top of the shoulder basically, and its tendon runs distally on the lateral aspect of the humerus, and it inserts somewhere down here on the deltoid tuberosity. Now, in general, the action of the deltoid, uh, at least the middle deltoid, is to abduct the shoulder. Now, hopefully everybody at this point is kind of imagining what shoulder abduction or abduction looks like. But what you may not think about is actually the nature of the pull is actually in this direction as shown by this black arrow. Okay? Uh, the pull is actually going to be kind of in line with the proximal part of this tendon okay? so that runs like this. Okay? It does curve around like that course, but the proximal part of the tendon is in this direction. So that's really the pull of the deltoid. And not to get into physics here, but again, you can break up this vector, if you want to think about that, into a vertical component and a horizontal component, right? So this arrow, as it's drawn, does it go up or down? Well, it's a little bit up, right? So we can show that up component in green. And in the horizontal direction, is it left or right? Well, it's pointed to the right, okay? So we can draw that right arrow in blue. And technically, you could say it's a medial pull. Um, that's probably the better terminology to use because, again, going this direction would be medial. So in addition to abducting the shoulder, the deltoid has a medial pull of the humerus, and it has a superior pull on the humerus. All right. Now, for the rotator cuff muscles, it really doesn't matter which one we talk about. I'm only showing two here, but they generally are all going to do the same thing. Okay? We're looking at an anterior view here because, again, this is the lesser tubercle over here. So the one that sits on top is the supraspinatus. Um, the anterior rotator cuff muscle that sits in the subscapular fossa right here, that is the subscapularis. Okay. Again, there's two more rotator cuffs on the other side, which would be infraspinatus and teres minor. Again, they're doing the same kind of thing. So a good example to start with is the subscapularis. So here's the muscular part over here in red. This is the part that originates on the subscapular fossa. And then the tendinous part runs up toward the lesser tubercle. And what's important to realize is when this muscle contracts, the scapula is the static part and the humerus is the mobile part. So the pull is going to be directed toward the muscular part over here, okay? So that means the line of pull of subscapularis is going to be this black arrow right there. Again, this arrow has horizontal part and it has a vertical part. Is the vertical part of this arrow oriented up or down? Well, it's oriented down. And is the horizontal part of this arrow oriented medially or laterally? Well, it's oriented medially, okay? And I won't go through the same thing with supraspinatus, but understand it's very similar there, and also the same for infraspinatus and teres minor on the other side. So all the rotator cuff muscles are going to have a medial pull and an inferior pull on the humerus. So now that you hopefully understand this over here, we can start talking about muscle balance and concavity compression. So muscle balance really refers to the stability of the glenohumeral joint more in the vertical direction. So for example, we don't want the humerus translating too far upward or too far downward. There's a little bit that we're willing to tolerate, but if it goes up too far superiorly, which is actually more common, that would result in subluxation of the glenohumeral joint. So we don't want the humerus going up too far. Likewise, we also don't want it going down too far. So how do we balance it right there in the vertical direction? Well, the superior pulls on the humerus better balance with the inferior pulls on the humerus. Okay? The inferior pulls on the humerus generally are the rotator cuff muscles, all four of them, and the superior pull is due to the deltoid. As long as the superior pull really is equal and opposite to the inferior pull by the rotator cuff muscles, then that humerus is going to be stable in the vertical direction. It's not going to go too far up or it's not going to go too far down. Okay, That's muscle balance. Now you can end up with muscle imbalance, and the most common uh, situation there is where the deltoid is just fine. There's no real problem with the deltoid, but the rotator cuff muscles, you always hear about those in medicine, they're weak or they're damaged. 
And so if they're weak or damaged, their inferior pull is going to be diminished. And so what happens there is if the inferior pull is diminished, now the superior pull is greater. Okay? Not because the deltoid is overworking, it's just that the rotator cuff muscles are underworking. And so now you have net superior translation of the humerus, and that leads to glenohumeral instability. So that's muscle balance. It has more to do with the vertical components here. They have to be balanced. In contrast, concavity compression has more to do with the horizontal components, the horizontal forces of the humerus relative to the glenoid fossa. And the glenoid fossa is not drawn here. But again, remember that the glenoid fossa is the medial part of this articulation. And if you want stability of this joint horizontally, then this humeral head better be pulled close tightly in the horizontal direction towards that glenoid fossa. And that's what these medial forces do. So let me ask you a question. Do you see anything here, or can you think of a muscle that would actually have a lateral pull on the head of the humerus? No. In general, all of these muscles, to some extent, have a medial pull. To have a lateral pull, the muscle would have to be way out here, away from the body, and we know that that doesn't exist. All the muscles are over here, so their net horizontal pull is in the medial direction. So think about that. You've got the medial pull due to the deltoid. You've got the medial pull due to the supraspinatus, due to the subscapularis. All of these muscles, even pectoralis major, which inserts on the lateral lip of the bicipital groove, it's still going to be pulling medially. Latismus dorsi inserts here, it's still going to be pulling medially. So you've got all this medial pull, and it really brings the humeral head medially and closer to the glenoid fossa. Okay? If you didn't have all that medial pull, then the humeral head would translate laterally more easily and away from the glenoid fossa. That would also cause dislocation more easily. But now that you've got this medial pull here, the humeral head is pulled medially really tight against that glenoid fossa, and that creates stability more in the horizontal direction. Okay? So when you think about muscle balance and you think about concavity compression, two of these non-ligamentous mechanisms, you got to think about each of these muscles here, and does it promote a superior pull on the humerus or an inferior pull? That's muscle balance, and those forces better be balanced in the vertical direction. And then with concavity compression, it's the medial pull on the humerus toward the glenoid fossa, producing stability in the horizontal direction. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of muscle balance and concavity compression. And we'll talk briefly about the other mechanisms probably in the next video. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.